my name is Louise McCluskey and this is the second part of the e-lecture on compression members and here I'm going to be covering member buckling resistance and I'm also going to be going through the first example. Clause 6.3 of EN 1993 part 1, 1 covers the buckling resistance of members. We use this equation 646 to ensure that the design compression force is less than the design buckling resistance of the section. Here the compression force is represented by NED, the subscript ED stands for design effect. For the design buckling resistance term, the subscript B indicates that we are dealing with buckling and that the RD means it's the design resistance. So here are the expressions that you need to work out the design buckling resistance and there are two separate equations so for the sections which are class 1, 2 or 3 we use equation 647 and for class 4 sections we use equation 648. Now both equations are the same except that the area used for the class 4 sections is the effective area, so that's the only difference. So we have chi, which is the reduction factor, times the area, times the yield strength divided by a partial factor, gamma m1, which is equal to 1. So the area and the yield strength are not too difficult to find, but we need to work out the value of this reduction factor, chi. So to find the value of chi, we use this expression 649 from clause 631. And it tells us that chi is equal to 1 divided by phi plus phi squared minus lambda bar squared all to the power of 0.5. And that has to be less than or equal to 1 since chi is a reduction factor. So those are two new terms introduced to us. And those are phi and lambda bar. Equation 649 also gives the expression for phi. And that's equal to 1 plus alpha times lambda bar minus 0.2 plus lambda bar squared. And that's all multiplied by 0.5. So again, we have a new term, and that's alpha, so already this might be a little bit confusing. So before we can work out the values of phi and chi, we need to know what alpha, sorry, we need to know what lambda bar and alpha are. So this slide tells us how to work out lambda bar, which is the non-dimensional slenderness. And just like the equation for working out the buckling resistance, we will use the gross area for classes 1, 2 and 3, and then the effective area for class 4 sections. So these equations, 650 and 651, are the same, apart from the area. So lambda bar equals the square root of the area times the yield strength divided by the critical buckling load. So you'll need to work out this NCR value before you can get lambda bar. And this is the equation for the elastic critical buckling load. It's not given in the Euro code, but you should be familiar with it since it is the Euler load. We have pi squared times the Young's modulus times i over this new term. Sorry. We have pi squared times the Young's modulus times the second moment of area divided by the effective length squared. So it's just based on the growth properties of the cross section. Alternatively, um, we also have the option to work at lambda bar using um, these expressions. So here for class 1, 2, and 3 sections, we have the effective length over the radius of duration of the relevant axes times 1 over this new term, lambda 1. The effective length over the radius of duration, so L over I is the same as the slenderness you use in DS5950, so the same as L over RY. So basically we have the slenderness from 5950 divided by the term lambda 1. Now at the bottom lambda 1 is divided is defined as pi times the square root of the Young's modulus over the yield strength, and that's also equal to 93.9 epsilon. So this is just another method that we can use to work out the non-dimensional slenderness. Now in order to work out phi, um, we need to know the value of alpha, and that will depend on the buckling curve that you will be using. We can determine the appropriate buckling curve from table 6.2, and then refer to this table 6.1 to get the corresponding value of alpha. The imperfection factor alpha depends on the shape of the column cross-section considered, the direction in which the buckling can occur, so either the y-axis or z-axis, and the fabrication process used on the compression member, so whether it's hot rolled, welded, or cold form. So here we have um, the top um, of table 6.2, and it's telling us that the buckling curve is telling us the buckling curves that we will need to use for road section. So here we have a set of limits, and those depend on the height and breadth of the section. We also need to know the thickness of the flange and decide which axis the buckling will be about, and also the steel grade. So if you know all of those, we can easily read off the required buckling curve. Refer to table 6.1 and get the value of it. And this is just showing you some other sections from table 6.3. So if you have a U, T or solid section, you use curve C. 
So L Saxon to use curve B and hollow Saxon to use curve A or C depending on the finish. So that's table 6.3. Now here is a diagram um, of the buckling curves and this is given as figure 6.4 in Eurocode 3. The buckling curves defined by Eurocode 3 part 1 1 are equivalent to those set out in BS5950 part 1 and in tabular form in table 24 with the exception of buckling curve A0 which does not appear in BS5950. Curve A represents quasi-perfect shapes. Curve B represents shapes with medium imperfections. Curve C represents shapes with lots of imper imperfections. And curve D represents shapes with maximum imperfections. Now the shapes of the curves are altered through the imperfection factor alpha, and it can be seen that for values of lambda bar less than 0.2 that the buckling factor is equal to 1. And this means that for compressed members of stocky proportion, there is no need to reduce the cross-section resistance. In this case, buckling effects may be ignored and only cross-sectional effects need to be applied. So if we don't like the expression and we don't like the equation, once we have calculated lambda bar, we could just use this figure 6.4 to get chi instead of doing the calculation. Now here are two photographs just showing the failure by buckling. On the left you can see some local buckling in the column and on the right you can see some column buckling, so that's interaction buckling. Now there are a few different buckling modes. So the first um, is overall flexural stock buckling. And this will control the design of compression members in most cases. In this buckling mode, the column will feel the excessive de deflection in the plane of the weaker principal axis. Now the second mode is torsional buckling, where a column will feel by twisting about the longitudinal axis. And this is unlikely for hot load sections, but it may be critical for cruciform sections. And then the third buckling mode is torsional flexural buckling, which can affect singly symmetric cross sections. Torsional buckling and torsional flexural buckling are not the critical critical buckling modes for doubly symmetrical I or H sections or hollow sections. So we are most concerned about overall flexural buckling. Buckling modes of torsional components are generally limited to cold form members. Now in the Eurocodes there is no guidance on the buckling modes for compression members with different end conditions. So I recommend that you should adopt the buckling lens used in BS5950 and you could also refer to the non-contradictory complementary information document SN008, which gives some guidance on effective length factors. And this table shows you the effective length factors for some columns held effectively in position at both ends. So for a column with both ends pinned, the effective length factor is 1, and for a column with both ends fixed, the effective length factor is 0.7. And then here are just some more examples of some end conditions and their effective length factors. You can reduce the effective length of a column by introducing lateral restraints, which in turn will usually increase the design compression resistance. You can see in the diagram that by introducing, introducing a lateral restraint at the centres of both columns, the effective length has been reduced significantly. So here, using a ruler, we can model end conditions. So here, the end conditions are both fixed, and we get this shape reduced. The effective length is 0.7 times the total length, and you can see that near the fixed restraints, the column cannot buckle. Therefore, it's only the central 70% of the beam which is affected by buckling. So that's where the 0.7 comes from. So here we're using the ruler to model an end column with two pinned ends, and the effective length is equal to the total length of the column. So you can see clearly that the whole length of the column has buckled. And here we can see how the effective length can be reduced by adding lateral restraint. So here are the design steps that you'll need to go through when determining the buckling resistance of a column. And we will use these design steps as a guide in the second example in the next section. So that's the theory on member buckling resistance covered, and now I'm going to go through a number of examples. So this is the first example I'll go through, and it's taken from the XSD website. And what you're dealing with is a pinned column using a non-slender universal column section. So what we need to do is to calculate the buckling resistance. So here are the partial factors that we will be using, and they're both one. And that is the same in both the Eurocode document and the UK National Annex. Now here is a diagram of our column. On the left, we're looking along the major axis Y, and the end conditions are both pinned, so the effective length factor is 1. But on the right, we're looking along the minor axis, the effective length factor is 0.7. So here's some basic data. We have the design axial load of 3000 kN. We then have the buckley length by both axes, so we multiply the column length by the effective length factors, which were given in the previous slide. And the steel grade we're using is S275 and our section is class 2. So we're dealing with a 305 times 305 times 97 UC. 
and here are a list of some of the section properties for our column. So the depth, width, wavelength front thicknesses, the root radius, the section area, and second moment area by both axes. And the first thing that we need to do is to work out the yield strength, Fy. And this example is using a table 3.1 from the Euro codes. And for a maximum thickness of 15.4 mm, we get a yield strength of 275 newtons per mm squared. Now, as you note at the bottom, and basically it's telling us that the national annex may impose values from either table 3.1 or the product standard. And we know that the UK national annex recommends we use the product standard. But in this case, we will still get an answer of 275 newtons per mm squared. So now we need to work out NCR. So we're given the Young's modulus. Um, we listed the second moment of area for both axes in the section properties, and we have already worked out the buckling length. So we just substitute in the values, we get the value of um, 7,205.3 kilonewtons about the y axis and 4,829.9 kilonewtons about the z axis. And now that we have the elastic critical force, we can work out lambda bar. So just substituting in the values, we get 0.686 and 0 0.838. Um, for the different axes, and there's a note here, and it just says that the that for a standard that's less than or equal to 0.2, that the buckling effects may be ignored. And earlier in the introduction, I told you that a column was described as stocky if it met that condition, but in this instance, both our values of lambda bar are above 0.2, and therefore we need to go on and check the buckling resistance. So now we need to go on and work out chi, the reduction factor, and for that we need need to know what phi and alpha are. The buckling curve is determined from table 6.2 and we have a row of action, h over b is 1.01, .01, which is less than 1.2, and the flange thickness is less than 100mm. Therefore, the buckling curve that we use for buckling about the yy axis is b, and for buckling about the zz axis we use curve c. So for buckling about the yy axis we use curve b, and the corresponding value of alpha from table 6.1 is 0.34. So putting that into equation for phi, along with a value of lambda bar equal to 0.686, then we get a result of 0.818. And we can then use this to work out the reduction factor chi, and that works out as 0.791. For buckling about the zz axis, we're using curve C, and the corresponding value of alpha from table 6.1 is 0.49. So putting that into the equation for phi, along with the value of lambda bar equal to 0.838, um, and we get a result of 1.007, and we can then use this to work out the reduction factor of chai, which works out as 0.639. We need to take the minimum value of chai, so in this case that would be 0.639, and that is less than 1. And we need to use this value 0.639 in our expression for the design buckling resistance, and we get a value of 2,168 kN. Compare this to our design compression force of 2,000 kN, and you can see that this section has more than enough resistance and can be adopted. So um, that was example one, and now I'm going to run through the same example using Master Key software. So for this problem, we're going to be using the Master Key Steelwork Design option. So um, the name, the name of the file first of all, so this is just a compression example, and then here's the screen that we're presented with. And here I've made sure to select the Eurocode 3 Design Code option. Now we're dealing with a column, so we need to select the Column and Simple Construction option from the Independent Design menu. And here is the default screen that was displayed. We need to input our section. So using the drop down boxes, I've selected 305 times 305 times 97 UC and grade S 275 steel. So that is the same as in our example. And here I've put in a value of 2000 kN for the design compression force and a length of 8 meters for the column. You may remember that the effective length factors for in the example are not the same. Well, for the minor axis Z, the factor was 0.7. So here in this box for the KY factor, I put in a value of 0.7, and that's for the minor axis. Now here are the results that come up on the screen, and I've highlighted the key area. So the compression resistance about the minor axis is approximately 2,167 kN. And if we compare that to the answer given in the example, we've got a value of 2,168 kN. So the answers are the same. At the bottom, we have the ratio of the design compression force and design compression resistance, and we have a value of 0.923, and again, that's the same as the example. So this end concludes the second part of the lecture on compression numbers, and in the next uh, 
in the third part we will have um exa we'll have two further examples. So thank you for listening.